So we are learning Likutei Sichos, Volume 1, for Parshas Tzav, this week. And we're in Chapter 10, page 206 in the Hebrew version. Me'idach. He said that one of the, 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 one of the things that the, that the fire symbolizes is that um, it's a preparation, the fire that's kept below, the eternal flame below, is a preparation for the flame that comes from above. Cold flame, hot flame. No, cold, cold, cold flame, hot flame was what we talked about before, the excitement. And here we're talking about the flame itself. And then he brought this example So when they built the tabernacle for seven days, the days of fulfillment, Imam Iluim, they had to take it apart every day. Why did they take it apart? Could have left it standing. So he explained here, because it was limited. And something limited always has an end. It's called the law of entropy. So when it ends, you take it apart. And that was the state that the tabernacle was in for the first seven days. And we said seven is by nature. Seven represents nature, the completion of nature. Here he calls it Yemei Ha'ikif. Why are they called Yemei Ha'ikif? I don't really know why, but I know mathematically what it looks like. I don't know if they meant, this is a statement from very early on. So I don't know if they meant what I'm going to tell you now. But Yemei Ha'ikif, basically means Bokir Tov, this what you have here is that you have Shabbos in the center that's the Shin and if you, it's called compactness theory and if you put six uh, circles the same size as a middle circle, it surrounds it exactly. Okay? Almost exactly. It's as close as you can come. So that's one of the reasons why the six weekdays are called Imei Kif, the surrounding days. So you have in the middle, and there are six circles around it. Okay? But that's the completion. So it says the seven days, the days of fulfillment, were like the Imei Kif. That they're the culmination of nature. That's why in nature we have seven days in every week. And that's, that's the highest there is. Shabbos is the highest within nature. But then the eighth day, there's a band now called the eighth day. Right? Why do they call themselves the eighth day? There's a song from Nomi Shemo called Yom Chet Bashavua. Since you've been in this Zionistic country for a long time, you've probably heard of it. No? I'm not singing it right, but it's the idea. What's the, what's the eighth day? The eighth day is what's above nature. You finish the seven days of nature. Sheva is savea. He's content. He's satisfied. And the eighth, the shmone, like we said yesterday, is, is fat already. It's the fat that's beyond the nature. So the eighth always represents that which is above nature. So on the eighth day, that's when the fire came down. It was only on the eighth day that the fire came down. And then they didn't have to take the tabernacle apart anymore. Why? Because now the infinite had revealed itself within the finite. And something that's infinite has no end. Me'idach, chapter 10, again, page 206. Me'idach, l'amrot she'nivreim l'ikshe'atzma minam misugalim l'agia l'dogot nitzchiyot. Even though created beings like us cannot get to something infin- infinite and eternal by themselves. You still need to complete the work below in order to come to this higher state of the infinite. As many times we've talked about this, that you have to do avat olam to get to avar It's not the same thing. They're completely different. But that's how the world works. You have to complete the work that you can do, and then that which is above and beyond what you can do appears. Uferusha davar, this means, Shekashera nivra oset kolashel becholto, afsha davar beagbala, noten lo kadosh bro ta eshe lemala beligvul. So, once I've done everything I can do within my limits, 
then God brings the fire from above, which is without limits. And this, this is the essence of sweetening. Sweetening, we're now in the sweetening already. Sweetening means the infinite within the finite. Infinite within the finite. Yeah. We say that the submission is finite. Like what we learned in the beginning of the week. That they had to use lobbying and diplomacy in order to avert the threat. But... So that, that, that in and of itself is, is submission, because you're submitting to the laws of nature, as it were. But still, the lesson is not that you should submit to the law of nature, but rather that the fact that you have to respect the laws of nature only works because you're above nature, and above nature you have to do tshuva. And that's another form of submission, to do tshuva, to say that I'm not, I'm not I, need, I need to fix things. That was the finite. The infinite was what we learned yesterday, about the fire shall never be extinguished. That's an infinite aspect. Now he's telling you, <coughs> this fire didn't appear by itself. Because what it says, the fire shall not be extinguished, that is talking about the act of identifying with the excitement that is holy. And that should be infinite, in the sense that it should be all the time. But there's something more. That's what I can do in my... I mean, even though I, I identify with the holiness all the time, I'm a limited being. So in the end, it turns out that I did something limited. Even though, again, I, in my mind, I'm identifying with something that's infinite. Because I'm excited about spiritual things instead of being excited about physical things. So I did all I could do. He says, but there's another level to this, that once you've done all you can do... You've identified with the infinite, even though you can't do infinite acts. Then the infinite comes down to you, and it informs, it imbues itself within the finite actions that you do. So that's a whole new level. That's what he's talking about now. And so this is even hinted to in the word always, in an eternal flame. Eternal flame, by us, means that we keep it alive all the time. But it's still finite, because we can only live so, so long. But now, the true eternity comes. Really, eternal means without any limits. Above time. So he says something that is uh, earthquake quality. He's saying time is quantified also. We know that energy is quantified. We know that matter is quantified. And those are two things that since the beginning of the 20th century has been established in physics. That energy comes in quanta. You can't get any amount, arbitrary amount of energy that you want. It's always going to be the energy of a photon. That's the smallest amount of energy that exists in the universe. And so far. No, there's no, nothing else. You can prove it. You're right. Everything is so far. But right now, this is what we know. We know this for a fact from every single observation we've made in every single area of physics. The quanta of energy is the energy of a single photon. Which is how much? It's a Planck. It's called a Planck. Very little. <laughs> it's so little that from our perspective you can get any energy you want arbitrarily. But in truth, they come in quanta. So energy we know. Mass we know. We know, that this, we know what the smallest mass is. I don't know, but we know. <laughs> okay. Okay? It's also related to the Planck constant. I don't remember how, though. But time? Why would time be quantified? Why would it be the smallest measure of time? So by Chazal there is. It's called Herifayim. But there's nothing smaller than that. But you could say Chazal have a very certain outlook and this is how they saw the world because that's how they saw the world back then. Maybe now it's different. So we don't know. We don't know about time. But there's a lot of good reasons in physics today to say that time is quantified. In any case, the Rebbe just says it, just accept it. Time is quantified. And because it's quantified, it itself is quantified. So time itself is limited. So, you, so how is it limited? 
it's not limited because there's no possibility of it continuing forever. It's limited in a different sense. It's limited as discrete quantities. That's also a limit. Infin infinitesimally small is limited infinitesimally small. You can't go as small as you, you want arbitrarily. There is some kind of smallest increment of time. In any case, because you have a finite uh, quanta of time, then it means that time is limited, and you could also sometimes extrapolate and say, because it's a finite amount, no finite amount can ever attain an infinite amount. And if I have um, one gram, I cannot create an infinite, as many one grams as I want, I cannot create an infinite weight. It'll always be countable, because I'm adding things, adding things that have that have some definition. The only way you can come to something that's not finite is if you add things that are not defined. Okay, in any case, so this is a big statement. It just has to be understood physically. But because I've completed all I can physically in the limited physical world that I inhabit, Hashem brings down the fire from above, which really means the aspect of the infinite into time. So time now becomes infinite, because you have a quanta of time, and this changes time, and it makes it, transforms it into something eternal. So what is the uvechen here? What, what do you get out of this? Every Jew is a tabernacle and a temple for Hashem. So he says he now brings both things together. He says, if you don't have excitement, when you learn Torah and you do mitzvahs, we talked yesterday about why he doesn't mention here, as it were, davening, right? In a moment he will mention davening. I said it could be that that was the answer to how come he's talking about the external excitation of the heart. Because that was the machlokas between Rav Aaron Strashala and, uh, and the Middle Rebbe. They said perhaps what he means to say is that you should be excited in every area except for davening. So in a moment he's going to mention also davening. Right now he just mentioned Torah and mitzvot. You should be excited there. That's the warmth, that's the life force that you, the, with which you do things so that your excitement doesn't fall into the mundane things. So you're not excited about seeing a movie, but you're in, excited about learning a daf. I saw, yesterday I saw a movie that gets you excited about the daf. <laughs> Art Scroll finished their English Yerushalmi. 52 volumes. 51, 52, I don't remember. It's quite an achievement. It's not, it's not a simple thing. Rav Adin, Rav Shtanzels wanted to do it next. But he didn't get around to it. He finished only when he was 80. He finished his, uh, a little bit before, 79. When he was uh, 79, he finished his, uh, his Bavli. But they have a whole team. They have 100 people working on it. So they finished it. What? He had a small team, but they didn't do the crux of the work. The crux, he, he did the translation, he did the... He, he had to see everything, and he did most of it. They helped him with research. But, um, mo almost every, the other things, they were done by other people. Like the Tanakh that he did, that really he taught every single chapter, he gave a shira in every single chapter, and then other people went and uh, made it into a book, into a commentary. But with the, with, the, with the Shas, he did it himself. In any case, so I said, I saw a movie that got me excited about learning the English Yerushalmi. <laughs> Our school put together a half-hour movie about the making of it. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so it was nice. Where did you keep all this stuff up from? I don't. They sent it to me. Validei so, Shlemut, so the, the, the excitation has to be when a person learns Torah and, and, and keeps a mitzvah. And he has 
everything that there was in the Mishkan, chasera lo ashrat ha-shechina, kivan shadvarim in lo ruach, even if he has everything that was in the Mishkan, if he doesn't have this excitation, if he doesn't have the fire that comes from above, then he doesn't have anything, everything is dead. He's doing it like he's not even here. Ad sh'alu liot shadeh. Yeah. But it's not just a stick of wood. A stick of wood didn't do anything wrong. But he says, at shalul liot shadayin kayam bo roshmo shachet ha'yigin. So much so that it could be that he's representing residue from the golden calf. Which we said, what is an avera that you have a residue of cause? What does it do to you? It makes you unexcited about things. It makes you un- and unable to truly commit to them. Torah and mitzvot, Torah and mitzvot, צריכים להיות בהתלהבות ובחויינות. They have to be done with excitement and with life. בכל שלוש תגבים. And they have to be done with excitement and with life in all three aspects, or three pillars. Torah, avodah, v'gimilut chasadim. Torah, avodah, meaning davening, today, v'gimilut chasadim. And doing deeds of kindness. Torah, what does it mean to be excited? אין אדם צריך לצאת ידי חובתו פרק חד שחרית ופרק אחד ערבית. שלה יממה כולה אין הדבר נוגע. This is we just said before. The time is limited. So under the constraints of time, the halacha says, you should learn at least something in the morning and something in the evening. But he says, if you're going to bring the fire down from above, so there's a lot of, sorry, the infinite that's now coming in. So you don't have to be limited. Don't limit yourself to just something in the morning and something in the evening. Rather, the learning should spread over the entire day. The learning is silent. When you want to excite yourself, one of the big things is those who express, who say the words. So even when you're learning alone, you should be learning in such a way that you're excited without actually expressing the words with your mouth. You're not excited. It doesn't touch you. Chayav liot lo yamus sefer Torah ze mipicha. There's a whole, whole question. Mipicha. It has to be in your, in your mouth. You have to ex- actually express it. There's a machlokus between the Alter Rebbe and the Gra. Whether when you learn, Oof. not just when you learn, in general, Aim dami. is thinking in your heart the same thing as speaking? Okay. They both learn from the Pasuk, Lo yamush sefer Torah zami picha, v'hagita bo yomam v'laila. The question is, what does v'hagita mean? V'hagita does it mean to express, to say, to utter something, so you actually hear the words? Or does Vagita come from the word higayon? Like higayon libi, like we say in davening. Higayon libi is like the thoughts of my heart. And if it's the thoughts of my heart, I I'm not speaking them, I don't have to speak them. In any case, so. חייב להיות לא ימוס ספר תורה זה מפיך, וחייב להיות ארוחה בכל רמה חברים, כל עצמותיי, תאמרנה בחיוניות. Everything has to be done in such an excited way that it seeps into my bones. עבודה, in terms of davening. So here, he says, על התפילה שהיא קו העבודה, and davening, which is instead of the service in the temple, לא להיות קבע. must not be some kind of rote, routine that you do. You, you should always add things in your davening so that it be a one-of-a-kind davening. You, even when you add things, you shouldn't say the same thing every single time. This should be rachamim v'tachanunim. That a person is asking for mercy from Hashem. If a person was asking for mercy, each time he'd find a new reason. He wouldn't just repeat the same reasons again and again. If your mind is and heart are really into it, then you'll find new things to say all the time. So it won't be routine. All my bones will speak of Hashem when I daven. 
and that means life force. So, sorry, did I just skip? Yeah. Toch tchushat chiyuniyot with life force. Milut chasadim, deeds of kindness. Hamitzvot sheklaliut sheklalit and mahavot et kavag milut chasadim. Mitzvot in general are the good deeds that the person does. They should not only be done in order to fulfill our, our obligation. Rather, it's, it's incumbent upon us to do mitzvot with life force. Life force is what, what it means to do a mitzvah behidr, to beautify the mitzvah. When you do it with the life. If you, if you don't do it with life, then you won't be able to beautify the mitzvah. You won't be able to go beyond the letter of the law. Again, the whole point is that I'm doing something, but I'm going beyond. I'm going beyond because that's the flame that's coming from above. And by the fire below being complete, the fire from above is drawn down. And then what happens? And then the Shekhinah dwells in everything that a person does, beginning with his Torah and his service, but extending all the way down to every physical action that he does, even physical actions. And that's what it means that the infinite now dwells within the finite. And then you see, you actually experience how within nature there is an element that's above nature, supernatural. And that leads to success that's above nature. Okay, I think we'll end here. So we have one more to do. One more here, the sweetening. Okay. So maybe Friday. After the collecting, 9.30 in the morning. You again collect on Friday also? Pouring, you know? So Thursday, well, why Thursday can't you? Know? It's, it's prim business is getting out of hand. <laughs>